Hey, Craig, how are you? Hey, fine, thank you very much. Sure, very thanks nice. for coming. So, welcome everyone. Today we are joined by Craig Dikers. Uh, Craig and Snowheda has established offices in Norway, Egypt, England, and the United States. His interest in design as a promoter of social and physical well-being is supported by ongoing observation and development of innovative and sustainable design process. As one of the founding partners of Snowheda, Craig has led many of Snowheda's prominent projects internationally, including the Library of Alexandria in Egypt, the Norwegian National uh, Ballet and Opera House in Oslo, the National September 11th Memorial Museum in New York, and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art Expansion. Uh, as well as the, most recently the French Laundry Kitchen expansion in Yachtville. Uh, welcome, Craig. Craig is also a, close, a good mutual friend, and we're honored to have him. Um, it's always, so first, always unusual to hear all those accolades. <laughs> well, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to re remember that I guess I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> well, that's starting out. Uh, you did do the Library of Alexandria at the age of 28, which is a pretty good splash to start out with. How did that, how did that come about? I mean, obviously that must be an architect's dream project, uh, especially a first big project, right? Yeah, very unusual circumstances. Um, sometimes we say we started off uh, really big and we've spent all these years trying to work on small things ever since. Um, so going the opposite direction, normally you start off with something small and you spend decades trying to make something of that magnitude, um, but it's been sort of somewhat the opposite direction for us. And we, we were a group of people, uh, interesting association of architects and designers, landscape architects who came together. We were all about the same age, mostly around the age of 30, uh, younger, uh, maybe one, one year old or something like that, but roughly around the age of 30. And um, we all decided at that time, way back in uh, 1989, that it would be interesting to try to pool our resources see where we could um, um, create a new way of working with um, society and architecture. And the Alexandria Library was a very intriguing uh, entrance into that world. Uh, it was an anonymous international competition. Uh, so when we won, they didn't know who we were. Uh, they were a bit shocked that we were so young, but um, I often say that um, it's a good thing they chose a young architect. We were naive enough and energetic enough to stick with it. And it took over a decade uh, to wow. complete. And um, when we were done, it it had success. It was uh, part of the um, uh, uh, democratic movement began in, in the library itself. And the citizens of Alexandria have protected it through strife uh, throughout uh, many of the troubles that have occurred there in the last decade or so. So we're very proud of it. <laughs> Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, what a project to start out with. Did you, did you always set out to be an architect? Is that aspirational from a young age or was it something you, you kind of fell into more or less? No, it was not aspirational from a young age. I, in fact, could not say that I understood precisely what architecture was as a child, although I was fascinated by architecture. And when I look back, I can see that I was interested in it. I just didn't know exactly what it was, some of my earliest clearest memories are interactions with wonderful places that I had experienced. I'm born in Germany. Um, my, I'm uh, 58 or 59 right now, and I've spent 33 years in Europe, uh, which is where I was born. So I'm both American and European in many ways. Um, and uh, throughout my uh, childhood, I was visiting many places in Germany and England and Europe. And I was always fascinated by um, this world of, of history that was embodied in, in these great works that I was seeing. And this is something that we miss, unfortunately, in the United States. Um, our history with architecture is relatively new. So we're, we're not able to be inspired sometimes by these great, magnificent works of, of ancient architecture. Other things can inspire us here, but it's sort of more every day that you see uh, great works of architecture in places like Europe uh, or China or other places like that with longer histories that are not erased. I mean, here yeah. we have history too, but that history has unfortunately been erased. And so uh, we're not able to inter interact with the deeper history of, of this continent. Yeah, and w speaking of that, I mean, where do you think most of the architecture in, in this country, where do you think its roots are found, like culturally? 
I mean, obviously, if you go to a lot of cities and we look at our capital in the White House, it looks very kind of reminiscent of, you know, Greek, yeah. Roman type stuff. Sure. Well, interestingly, um, we do have our cathedrals, these great works that um, all of society has, uh, has uh, decided to make, but they're not buildings. The cathedrals we've made here in this country are basic system and the automobile. So well, whereas Europe uh, society through everything at creating these magni magnificent monuments of, of, um, of religious structures, um, we spent our energy on making cars and on making highways. And that took just as much effort. So the context of how we understand what our, our interests are is very different. Um, so in, in a cathedral, for example, it's much often, very often a vertical space. The acoustics are tall. The, uh, the sound kind of come, drapes over you from above like rain. Uh, yeah. There's a tremendous amount of space that you can peer into. There's a lot of uselessness, obviously, as religion has that kind of capacity to provide useless space that seems meaningful. Uh, we imbibe, uh, you know, a certain kind of amount of that in our lives. Here, uh, the highway systems, the freeway systems are that, and they're very different. So when you're in a car, it's not vertical, it's horizontal, the world because you're looking out for other cars so they don't hit you. Sounds, horns, honking, everything comes in from the side. Yeah. Uh, so we're going this way, and the great monuments uh, of architecture often go this way. And so uh, coming to terms with those two worlds is quite intriguing for me. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, and it, so how do you think that affects culture? Because I'm obviously, I think architecture in many ways it delivers an emotional response to people. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think the effect of that is on, on American culture? Well, it's hard to stereotype any, any kind of culture. I mean, uh, even the great monuments in uh, European-based architecture uh, changed or removed previous cultures before them. So uh, it's not like they're, that's an, uh, that, that world isn't immune to that sort of thing. But yeah. in this uh, country, uh, the speed at which you move in an automobile is, is a priority. So you, you miss a lot as you, as you move in a car. Um, you knock down things so that you can make roads and those things are gone uh, and you don't even experience them. So uh, erasing things is a big part of what an automobile culture, if you're not careful, can be about. Now, automobile companies today recognize uh, that this is something they want to work with. So they're dealing with different types of mobility, more sensitive types of mobility that are related to vehicles so that we're not treating the car now as we did in the past. And we're very excited about that future. And in fact, we're working together with the Ford Motor Company as they build uh, a sensitive world for mobility uh, that is, uh, can be appreciated by all types of people. Uh, that's interesting. Very cool. Um, and so with what's going on in the world today with, you know, obviously COVID and this big transformation and, 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 and behavior, like, are you seeing any emerging trends? I mean, how is this going to, what's going to be the, the longest lasting effects on architecture, do you think, and, and spaces in the built world coming out I'm, of all this? I'm, I'm, I'm very hesitant always to be a kind of a crystal ball reader. I, I find yeah. that that's a very challenging. Nevertheless, uh, there are certain things that do interest me that I hope for and work towards uh, in the future. Uh, two, two, of course, important areas to discuss now are um, public health and um, biological uh, hazards that we have to deal with. Uh, and the other is, of course, social justice and uh, creating more uh, equitable platforms for a wider audience to be involved in creating and managing the built environment. And actually, both of those things are somewhat closely related, as we've seen in, in, in recent months, the fact that although the virus doesn't have a socioeconomic path that it takes, it tends yeah. to be those with more challenging lives socioeconomically, and certainly those of particular um, racial backgrounds have more, uh, uh, more cases because of the nature of their lives, affect the, uh, the virus affects them more. But um, in, in a sense, we have to understand how this, these viruses come to us what's causing them at a root. It's not because we didn't wear masks. It's not because uh, we didn't wash our hands enough. Uh, the virus came because uh, our understanding of habitat and biodiversity is very weak. So manufacturing uh, moves into uh, uh, natural conditions where animals have lived relatively peacefully. 
for um, thousands and thousands of years. So human interaction with these environments has created stress on various types of animals, uh, which causes them to shed their disease, which they wouldn't shed otherwise to us. And then uh, we see the effects of that all the way around the world because we fly so much and you know, flying is a big part of it. And one of the things I, I uh, and moving, I often say that in, it's interesting for me in terms of COVID-19 that there are only two mammals that can fly. There are birds and creatures that fly, but only two mammals. And the other one's a human can fly on, on its own terms with its own power. We fly sustained flight, although it's in machines that we create. No other two creatures can are capable of sustained flight. Yeah. And now we're deeply intertwined in terms of our health because mobility and movement is also something we don't manage very well, except for crazy people saying we need to build walls and separate everyone. That's not going to help either because viruses don't care how tall yeah. the wall is. A virus will go over a wall. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really yeah, matter. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And then moving from there, you get into issues of uh, equity and social justice and we were talking earlier about European architecture, which is, of course, what we are trained for in our profession. But our profession yeah. is built around people who can either afford to study that, which tend to have a European-based tradition, or they tend to ignore other traditions, uh, the Chinese tradition, the African tradition, all of these powerful works of architecture that actually had tremendous influence even on our lives as European-based individuals. Um, but we tend to overlook them. And so... I think we need to start to find ways uh, that connect to those worlds and allow our education system to also open up to different perspectives. Hey, do you think the world of architecture in general, do you think that that's happening? Do you think that there's more of like, uh, like a focus on bringing you know, new, new, new styles in? Yes and no. Um, certainly there are more, we are learning more about architects from places we never used to hear of. Uh, there are African architects that are getting recognition or people who began their practices in Africa. Chinese architecture yeah. has taken a central stage in the world and people have begun to respect it, its advances in a way that has affected people in the West or European-based individuals uh, to see new perspectives. So it has happened. Has it happened enough? Well, probably not. So we should be thankful for what has happened and we should be eager and energetic to um, grow those worlds even further. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And then going off of that, like, what do you think the relationship is between architecture and urban planning? And how do you think that that's being changed? Well, one of the things that's interesting to me is I am somewhat left wing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor of removing, removing border walls. And we built a lot of border walls in our profession. So we built border walls between architecture and landscape. We built them between urban planning and architecture and so on. Our studio is one studio that con contains all of these people working together. So we're landscape architects, architects, interior architects, and planners all sitting in a sp space normally if we had our studio available to us right now. Um, but we're able at least uh, technologically to interact in real time with different perspectives. And so there should be a direct link between these worlds. It's only recently that we've artificially segregated them politically. Yeah. Uh, there should be no reason that a landscape architect shouldn't be able to lead an architecture project and vice versa. Um, so this is one of the worlds that we're dedicated to. Yeah. And I think that, that makes, that's one of the things that makes you and Snow Hedda really unique. I think if you think, when I think of most famous architects and architecture firms, it usually centers around one person um, and kind of their own personal name. Uh, and it seems like Snow Hedda, like you think of Snow Hedda, the company, not necessarily one specific person, even though you're obviously one of the main founders. Um, and I, I think, like, how does that affect your projects? Um, obviously, it's, it's probably one of the only big, big architecture firms that's structured like that, but clearly known for its collaboration. You know, it's, it was a counterintuitive choice, first of all, to choose a name that no one could pronounce, or there was an out, a letter in it, a vowel, that nobody knew what the vowel was outside of the Scandinavian countries yeah. for the most part. Um, mathematics people think it's the uh, sign for zero in programming. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, it's a kind of an odd thing. And, of course, we have t multiple narratives as to why we had the name, uh, so there's no single narrative. And we're multiple uh, disciplines and many, many people. So... 
if you were making a smart business move, this would be the last thing you would do. Um, on the other hand, it's what we believed in. Uh, we were very early in saying, uh, this isn't about individuals. It's not about heroes. It's not about stars, even if there are individuals who are heroic. And furthermore, there are great individual heroic architects out there who I really admire. So it's not negating their work, but it's suggesting that we need a balance in our world between these, the more what I would call sort of old school modernists, uh, no. people that work as though they were from the old world, but in a modern way. And what I would call new world modernists, which are people that are looking beyond the traditional means of coalescing into a studio effort. So we're, we've believed in that since the very beginning. It's, it's a hard course to drive. It's not perfect. We've got lots of problems. We, it's not like we've solved all the problems. We have just as many problems as everybody else. But it provides a new perspective, a different perspective that addresses the complexities of society that we face through a complex society of our own. Yeah, that, and that's uh, cool. so we, you know, that's kind of what it, we're, we're, where we're, where our head is at. And I, and I guess also that's probably why every one of your projects are so different. Like it probably keeps up this innovative new creativity because there's so many different minds working on any specific project. <laughs> It's true, and we have uh, another bad business decision was not to have a manifesto. Um, so we, for many years, we avoided a manifesto. We avoided a, a model of how you should design, which many people do very well. We, we never said, well, if you do this and you do this and you do that, or in some version of other orders of those things, you will have a, a work of architecture or design. Uh, we are, our, one of our modes of thinking is that human nature uh, kind of di dislikes models of, of behavior. As soon as you create a model of behavior, yeah. humans want to break it. That's um, true. We, we, we just love it. Yeah, we have to break things. And, that, and those, the breaking of something and the challenge of either repairing it or making something new is what gives us intelligence. If, if there were an ideal solution for everything, I doubt we would be human. We'd be something yeah. else. So, so we, we, one wants to pursue improvement, one wants to evolve, but one wants to never assume that such a uh, perfect environment should or could exist. And so um, we try to avoid manifestos. On the other hand, we have things we're deeply passionate about, understanding, um, as I mentioned, habitat, biodiversity, yeah. the influence of anthropogenic behavior uh, upon our natural world. Furthermore, uh, an extension of that is our uh, dependence on natural resources to create uh, new structures and the, the relevance of that to uh, the speed of climate change and climate abuse. Uh, those things are also interwoven with our political stand on social and cultural equity, um, yeah. which is hard to achieve, no doubt. And we're, yeah. not, we're far from perfect, um, but it is one of our, one of our goals. That's interesting. It's kind of like your company culture. It's like create to achieve the perfect, you create an inherently imperfect atmosphere, if you will, which I think That's is correct. Very, very, yeah, no, yeah. very true. Even sometimes our competitions you, are done that way. We might do a competition in a slightly stressed environment just to get us going. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, though. I think the most innovative people and, and concepts come out of that environment. You can't, perfection and being a perfectionist doesn't lead to innovation. <laughs> well, that's the no, way I, I feel, but some people might disagree with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when, when you get a new client, do you prefer that they, you know, sort of outline exactly what they want? Or do you prefer that they kind of, you know, say their needs and then you come up with the vision? Yeah, it's somewhat of a rhetorical question. I don't think there's a direct answer. We really enjoy working with clients who are strong-willed, have lots on their mind, are energetic, are visionary, are really wanting things. Uh, um, and so that helps drive us. On the other hand, we often tell clients also, or people that yeah. are working with us, that it's always better to want what you get than get what you want. <laughs> yeah, small, uh, small sense. little nuance there, but it's true. So when you get something that you didn't expect and you really want it, yeah. that's in a way so much more powerful than just getting someone to give you what you asked for back. Totally. So, so it's a balance of those, those worlds. 
I know in the United States, um, there is a kind of theory that architects need to listen and listen more. Well, yes, listening is important, but if we're sponges only, we're, and all we do is listen, and we don't no. participate, then uh, we, we don't have strength in architecture. And I think some of the strongest architecture we see is are from architects who wish to participate in the conversation as well as listen. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, I think also with architecture, I think the greatest architects like yourself and Snowhead, I think it's delivering a surprise, like you said, something that you giving, delivering what the client wants, but that they didn't know, they couldn't envision themselves. And sometimes we surprise ourselves. So it can, yeah. you know, make, and a lot, many times I often say that our best work comes from a surprise that came from the client. They maybe didn't recognize what they said or meant, but, and then we make it Later into something three dimensional and give it back. And they're like, wow, you know, yeah. so each, each group in this, uh, you know, wonderful multi-handed cabal needs to be uh, uh, generous and also thoughtful. So that brings me to like SF MoMA. I know you did the wonderful expansion here in San Francisco. It's beautiful. Um, I remember like the new, if you look at the exterior of the building, it's very horizontal. I remember that, that ex you explaining that. And it is really interesting because it's in the middle of downtown where everything is vertical. Um, how did you come to that? Because it's a really interesting concept and it really is the only kind of horizontal looking building down there. Yeah, it's a discussion we've had for many years, and that is cultural buildings can afford, and in a sense, by nature, they need to be generous. A cultural building is, by its very definition, a generous institution. Yeah. And that means that it can't be greedy. Um, and uh, commercial institutions, in some ways, have, whether, whether they wish to or not, the opposite um, kind of mindset. They need to occupy, they need to take, they need to... Um, build from things that they acquire. Um, they, the commercial institutions don't give things away by nature, whereas yeah. cultural institutions do. Even if you pay for a ticket to get in, they, they give you things. Uh, it, it's There are different types of cultural institutions, obviously, some that you don't even have to pay for, like libraries. Um, but in any case, uh, a commercial building has to take its site, maximize its site, and maximize how much space it can get on that site. That's not necessarily the right way to go, but that's the, the general uh, motivation. You have to talk through uh, a, de a developer's understanding often to suggest to them that actually being generous can help you uh, build value on your site. So space can be useful outside the building as well. In the museum, like the SF MoMA, that was easier to discuss because they want to be generous. So instead of taking the entire site, which we could have done legally, wow. we could have filled out the whole site and built up uh, even higher than we went as, you know, to a kind of commercial sized building. Instead, we pulled the, 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 the limits back of the building and went a little lower, which created a horizontal feel. And so you know yeah. it's not commercial. You can see that thing all the way from, I climbed to the top of the, um, Oak, uh, of the Bay Bridge once and looked back and you could see it from that far away. And it was so unique, this horizontal sail, rock-like form moving through these vertical, very large, very, very powerful, um, mostly black in color uh, forms. Uh, so it, it served its purpose. And that horizontality yeah. is something that you can explore with cultural projects. I, I think it also creates a more intimate space when you're lower and more elongated. Um, mm. It's one of the cool things about the Apple headquarters that Norman Foster did, which is it's instead of building a high rise, it was really yeah. just like a spread out kind of space where you're looking at each other in a way. Um, yeah, and animals can relate to that in a, in a unique way. So even our SF MoMA, and earlier I was talking about biodiversity and habitat, um, a couple of things we did in relation to climate change too. Um, we did not want to take down the Mario Bota building. We think it's a great yeah. building and worthy of staying, even if you may disagree with it in, in ways. The it's front like, section of MoMA. Yeah, yes, yeah. the front section of MoMA. It, it's, it, it's a building that had tremendous uh, importance in the city. But there yeah. were people saying, take it down, take it down. And we yeah. said, absolutely not, for, for many reasons. First of all, we respect the building. Second of all, why would you take down a building that works well when you're trying to conserve natural resources? 
and conserve impact on the environment. Secondly, by creating this horizontal form, pulling it away, building the green wall, actually animals do come there. I, birds flock around that building like you wouldn't believe, That's more so than just next door. And uh, at the top, you can find ladybugs in the, in the, in the, in the, in the summer season. Um, you know, all kinds of animals go there. So it's made a little biological microclimate. It's not as much as it could be, obviously, but it's pretty exceptional for being uh, south of market. Yeah, and I think one brilliant thing about it, too, you guys integrated perfectly. It's not like you have the old wing and all of a sudden everything looks entirely different. It's like a very smooth, seamless transition to the new, which is which you kind of see in the entrance lobby, which is really cool. Um, and I think my favorite aspect of the building, I wish I could show a photo, but there's a staircase, you know, with the little skinny windows. There's something so beautiful about that staircase, you know, on the side of the building there. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That's the one that goes up. It's like a series of stairs. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so that, that has become, you know, again, this is another interesting point to make about architecture, especially in North America um, and in the United States. People are generally afraid of stairs. And every time we offer a stair as part of a design, people say, no, nobody takes the stairs. Why would yeah. you make a stair? It's used to just, you know, there's a small one over there. And our response is, if you make a stair, great. Everybody yeah. will want to take it. So because true. it's a joy. And so in the San Francisco MoMA, it used to be about 85% um, of the visiting population took the elevators and only, wow. you know, maybe 15 took the stair. Now with the new stairs involved, it's exactly the opposite. About 80% take the stairs and about 20% take the elevators. So what you have is people um, having a more healthy life by moving more and yeah. Uh, exercise a more social life because they interact with people on the stairs more than they would in the scary feeling of being in an elevator. And finally, you have this feeling of ownership. When you, yeah. when you, when you make it to the top of the stair and you're still alive, you're like, yeah, I did it. You know, I, I'm, I, I, this is my building. <laughs> yeah. I think that that's a really great point about architecture really, uh, it affects, it's an art form that really affects health and socializing and it's such a, yeah. such a, you know, such a, an interesting art form in that sense. But I do agree, if you design, it's the power of good design. If you design something well, people will use it. I think that was the thing in San Francisco City Hall, it has one of the grandest staircases and people use the staircase. Yeah, get married and take their pictures on it and everything. Yeah, it becomes a social thing. So that brings me to your next thing. So architecture for you, and it's a deep question, um, but like what is architecture for you? Because I mean, obviously architecture is very much an art form, it's a science and it, it really eludes an emotional sensation. Um, especially beautiful yeah. architecture. So like MoMA, for example, the new wing, it's, it's not distracting from the art, which I think is really brilliant because sometimes you run the risk of doing that. It accentuates and complements the art, but is an art form in and of itself, which is a delicate balance. Yeah, I mean, the question is, has a sort of embedded in it a feeling that you're going to get an answer that tells you that architecture is great or what makes it great and what makes it wonderful. And of course, being an architect, I have to assume at some level it has yeah. value in society. And um, I would say from a very base perspective, I have two, I have one serious answer and one funny answer. Although funny, it does actually have value. The serious answer is architecture is something that helps create memory in your life. Um, and memory is a challenge. Um, you know, we take it for granted often, but memory, we can lose, you know, my brother actually has a, a disability where he has lost his short-term memory. And to see how he exists without that tells me a lot about the value of memory in our lives. And, and buildings and architecture and landscape help us remember that we exist. True. And that we move through places. Art can do that, but, but architecture is more utilitarian. So creating memory through something that has a utilitarian uh, side to it is important, which brings me to my second humorous answer, which is somewhat related to it being utilitarian. And that is, someone asked me once, what's the difference between art and architecture? And I said, well, if you can pee on it, it's probably architecture. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it's, and it's funny and stupid and silly, but it's true. Uh, we treat, you know, art has this kind yeah. of place that's hard to grapple with. Architecture and landscape and everything is everywhere. So we interact it, with it in a visceral yeah. way. And we should not be ashamed. 
that, you know, we pee in buildings or that toilets are important and we design toilets. That's well, nothing to be ashamed also of. Also, art is looked at. Art is looked at as something that's like alive. You can't touch it. Yeah, it's true. It's a living organism. It's like someone's almost a baby. Yeah. Whereas architecture is always alive, but it's alive on its own terms. And you, as an architect, you have to release it. So that's the interesting side. The negative side is that architecture is a form of monument. And we don't often recognize that, but it can yes. be overwhelming, overpowering, and unwelcoming. And this is a big part of the social justice issue that we face today. You know, are the buildings that we are making, as European-bodied individuals anyways, uh, actually inviting a world beyond the ones that we're privileged to, to participate in? And furthermore, are those people out there that could be doing the same things that I'm doing able to do it so that, you know, they can yeah. create their own world? Um, so the education system needs to be reevaluated. Uh, we don't have enough uh, positive uh, uh, roots for education amongst a wider uh, a group of people, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have to make sure that our buildings don't become, you know, we're, we're, people are taking down statues of Civil War generals. Some of the buildings that we've created yeah. are as oppressive totally. as that, but you just can't take them down and it would be stupid <laughs> to take down many buildings because that's yeah. a waste of money. But and on uh, that, I think, you know, I think of a lot of public schools that were probably built in like the 50s, 60s, and they look, there's one public high school in the city, and it's the same architect as San Quentin Prison, and they look like prisons, a lot of these places. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's a really interesting point and totally valid. I think that's the amazing thing with architecture, that it really becomes monuments, you know, it's not a mistake that you know, SF City Hall looks or the Capitol looks very Greek and Roman. Every, you know, they, clearly the intentions were to kind of elude this em, empire type of sensibility. Um, yeah, and a European privilege. And as much as we yeah. love that building, and I love it, I mean, it's hard not to love those buildings, right? But loving it is different than analyzing it and realizing its consequences. Yeah, and different <laughs> meanings. They really are monuments. And going back to what you said, I think of a lot of cities that I know well, but maybe don't know the streets and identify different neighborhoods by, you know, oh, is it near that building? Is it near this yeah. building? So they really become landmarkers. And like you said, memory is really based upon what building were you in or near? Or you remember, you know, or yeah, what experience exactly. you had there. And we often say that it's more important to remember an experience you had rather than what the building looks like. Uh, that's called a social exactly. monument as opposed to a physical monument. And, and hopefully it's um, a good experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Um, what, what architects in the past do you think most closely align with your, um, your vision of architecture and your, your sensibility? Oh, uh, gosh, that's a, that's a big one. Um, it's a hard uh, one. There was a, yeah, yeah, there's a several. I mean, when I was in Egypt, I learned a lot about Hassan Fati, amazing architect. Uh, now deceased, um, who really built in, on uh, the roots of architecture and communities. I, I still I look back to his work. Uh, in terms of uh, contemporary European that are now deceased, uh, would be um, Hans van der Lohn, uh, spelled, um, his last name is L-A-A-N, van der Lohn, an uh, uh, architect from the Netherlands who was also a Franciscan monk. He just Very understood cool. the sublime so well. Um, so there are those kinds of people. And of course, I was close with Svetofan and John Lautner. These people were big inspirations to me. Yeah. They understood how to make uh, sculptural works that really just challenged you, but always felt comfortable and always had a slight kind of messiness to them, which is, is yeah. nowadays, you can't get messy anymore. The critics just beat you up like, oh, look at that. That's messy. Yeah. Actually, the messy Everything has to be kind of cold. Yeah. And perfect. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. But, but like you said, I think the, per the perfection comes from the imperfect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I once had a tour of the uh, John Lautner home in, in Beverly Hills in the hills, the, sh the Goldstein Sheets residence. Yeah. It's from the Big Lebowski. It's such an incredible home. I mean, it really is. It's a work of art, but has that messiness to it. Like yeah. What you're I got to be with John Lautner nearly every day when he was alive. My studio was down the street from his. Oh, and uh, I went there every day, and I actually helped organize a lecture of his work one time. Oh, that's so cool. I worked that with Coy Howard. And, no, that was in, in Los Angeles. Oh, wow. and, uh, oh, wow. and I worked with Coy Howard for a while there, too. It was a big inspiration for me. 
I worked with some architects in Texas, uh, Michael Benedict. Those are living people. Yeah. So that's amazing. It must have been phenomenal. Um, and what, what do you think about like, because architecture really is a marriage between art and science. Like, uh, and business. Yeah. It's a menage a trois. Yeah, so yeah. you have to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in what way do you think it's a sign? Like, uh, do you think it's more of an art or a science or just a combination? Oh, I, I don't think you can give any one uh, benefit over the other. On the other hand, I would say that if you forget about the art, it loses its capacity to be architecture. Um, a, a building, uh, architecture is different than an instinctual structure, which I would call, say, a building or a shelter. Buildings or shelters are great too. They're amazing. Yeah. Shelters especially. We we just somehow in, inherently, instinctually know how to build a shelter. No one has to tell us. It's like a spider instinctually knows how to make a web. It doesn't go yeah. to university to learn how to make better spider webs. And yeah. we do that too. But architecture is based on an artistic understanding that pulls you outside of your basic needs and puts you into an understanding of life that uh, that goes well beyond what you need to do at any moment in time. And that's its value. And by the way, that's not just about taking you into the future or even taking you into the past. It can take you into this infinitesimally small moment that we call the present. Yeah, it's, I guess very much like the same with, with, you know, a painting, a great painting. I guess it makes you reflect on things. And, and kind of think about other things. And I think that is the great thing with architecture is a really well done building puts you in kind of a, it changes your mood and your emotional state. Hopefully. Sure. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, what, um, tell us about Wide Awakes. Oh, well, I'm involved in a lot of uh, issues that, I mean, we, it's in, we're in an interesting time right now. Uh, the, the consciousness of the world is uh, being woken up. Uh, technology has created a shift in consciousness. Uh, we are dealing with issues that in this country anyway, uh, people have been dealing with in some form uh, at a wide spectrum for four or 500 years or more, uh, depending on uh, which uh, part of the, the story you are a part of. Um, so uh, now more than ever with uh, our ability to see more, to understand more, to learn more uh, from, from each other, uh, then uh, we have the capacity to push change forward. I'm involved with a lot of artists um, and a lot of creative uh, individuals. And some of our thinking is that um, all the fight is important. All the new legislation is important. All the work we have to do with government is important. All the work we have to do with law and legal restrictions, all of that is important. And we have to continue to go out in the street and say what we feel. But if we don't protect the thing that we're actually fighting about, and that is the culture that, these, uh, that our world represents, the, the creative energy yeah. that black uh, people of color, indigenous people have created over centuries. If we don't allow that to flourish and become a powerful part of our future, then we will have made all these changes and perhaps left the heart out. So yeah. my, my, uh, my goal is to be, participate with these groups they're, um, they're uh, led by different people. I'm not a leader. I'm a supporter and a facilitator, and I lend my knowledge of things that uh, are, is unique uh, to help move things forward. Wide Awakes is just a group. It's not an organization. I didn't found it. I just like to help them out, and I participate and yeah. do anything I can to move it forward. And we don't have any, any rules. You just, you're creative. You use your creative energy, and you don't let creativity die when the fires are burning all around. Yeah, that's right. I know Jose Parla, our, our friend, is also involved with that. Yeah, that's right. Jose is more and more deeply involved, and there's a group yeah. called We're the Blacksmiths and a bunch of other people. But I, I do what I can. And uh, Wide Awakes is a is a memory of an organization that existed in the 1860s that was actually Republican back when the Republicans oh. were on the side of abolitionism, and you know yeah, when, when Lincoln was a Republican, yeah. and and they were actually pushing Lincoln to push harder to give greater rights. Uh, to the populations that were subjugated and abused. And, and so um, they, they, they were called wide awake because they moved through the city in Washington, D.C., and they made people awake. And so that's where that came from. Hopefully we're going to be a part of, a, of an exercise in D.C. on the anniversary of the wide awakes coming up in the fall.
But you know, that's just one thing. We're doing a lot of other things. We recently helped paint a Black Lives Matter mural that we didn't design. It was designed by Bronx artists who got a public grant to do it in front of uh, the um, Thurgood Marshall um, uh, as a court, courthouse building in Foley Square in downtown New York City. Uh, I've been pushing with this one guy named uh, Beckford, who's uh, Anthony Beckford, who's leading Black, Black Lives Matter in Brooklyn. He's just a really inspirational character. Yeah. There's just so much out there that everybody can do. And, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And okay, so I know you're a little tight on time, so close to wrapping it up, but what, what is your favorite building that you, that Snowhead was not involved in? It could be even a small building. It doesn't have to be a famous architect. A building that you remember yourself in memory that is a place, just fond memories. You just love something about the building. Could be anywhere. Well, um, again, t difficult question because there's so many versions yeah. of that. Architecture and landscapes are huge. I can tell you the, the what sounds like a simple and stupid answer, but it has tremendous value to me. When I first saw the Taj Mahal, um, I remember people used to tell me in India, there, the world is divided into two groups of people, those that have seen the Taj Mahal and those that have not seen the Taj Mahal. And I thought that was just stupid. And when you see pictures of it, it's a yeah. postcards and everything. But my God, what a powerful building. It has a feminine, and I hate to use those words. It's yeah. wrong. I, I wish there was another word, but it has a quality that just is so, so intimate and emotional. generous and yeah, yeah, emotional. And it just wants you to, to kind of be a part of a larger picture That's and, and, and approach it. And despite the fact that it is somewhat large as a, as a structure, and it has almost no function, uh, real utilitarian function anyway. Um, you just are drawn to it, the way the sunlight moves through the marble and just, you can feel the energy of the sun wow. inside of it. So, and the way you approach it and the gardens and everything. Uh, and of course I was lucky when I was there. So I'm probably very special. I got to see it alone because we won the Aga Khan prize. So they let us in before the gates opened and there was a okay. setting. Yeah, the moon was setting, a, 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 a sickle-shaped moon was setting while the sun was rising on, on either side of it. It was wow. spectacular. That incredible. So, yeah, so that's a memorable. And there's plenty of small buildings yeah, that I've amazing. seen everywhere. Adolf Loos, Louis Sullivan, Grinnell, the bank in Grinnell, that mm -hmm. something, you know, I could go on. Yeah, and then speaking of landscape, I know you did the kind of the transformation of the, um, the like, Times Square. <laughs> Which is pretty yeah, that's cool. urban. That's more like urban design in a way because yeah. most people, it is landscape, but most people think landscape architecture is vegetation, Gardens. but it's not. It can be yeah. hardscape too. So we tried to create a space that had value to different types of people. It's not architecturally worthy. So it's not the kind of thing that an architect would go to and go, oh, wow, that's amazing. Right, Look right. at all of this. But it functions really in, in an interesting way. And also, it, it it's can't be hectic in this hectic kind of world right there. Yeah, and you know, it worked equally well during the height of the pandemic quarantine here. So it, it, it took solitude really well. And yeah. when the, um, when the um, after the George Floyd killing and the protests began, it took the crowds in, in Times Square too. Uh, we cleared out a lot of junk. Most people don't know how much, we took away more than we had. That, that's the success of Times Square. So uh, we'll wrap it up here, but favorite, uh, favorite restaurant in New York? Uh, you live in Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a great place I really love. It's called La Morada. It's in South Bronx, M-O-R-A-D-A. It's a group of Oaxacans who were uh, immigrants, uh, and they're part of the um, group of people that are setting up uh, initiatives for immigrants and people who are, are having difficulty finding asylum and so on. Uh, really good cool. food. I love Oaxacan food. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, of course, there are many wonderful restaurants. Cosme is, you know, the, the big names that yeah. you know about. But, you know, going to a place like La Morada is just not only delicious, but, you know, really, really uh, a, a wonderful place to be. Great and experience. the Bronx is yeah. really cool. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, that, there's so many others. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, final thing. I know that you have a passion of kind of going off on your own for like a few days in, in the desert. What is it about? Yeah. The desert that draws you. Because I actually, Frank Lloyd Wright, I think, really loved the desert as well. You know, yeah, I had Tallahassee and West and everything like that. Yeah. Like, what is well, it my, about the desert? 
And my connection to the desert is multifold. Um, my father is from the desert. He grew up in the Chihuahua Desert on the border before there was a border, so La Frontera. So he's a Mexican-American heritage and European heritage. Um, so uh, his life was always interesting to me and I got to spend time in that part of the world and I just was drawn to it. But furthermore, the desert is fragile habitat and um, the Chihuahua is the largest, uh, among the largest deserts in, on the continent and it is the least explored habitat anywhere in North America. Wow. So uh, what we have now is the building of border walls that cut right through the middle of the Chihuahua Desert. So not only is this segregating populations who for centuries were well connected, uh, but it is also segregating animal habitats that <coughs> need to be structured together. Yeah. So um, these have not been evaluated in any real way. And I, one of the reasons I went out there last time was to just see that for myself, but also just being in the desert and seeing how life can come from nothing or yeah. what in, to it's a fire. human brain, it looks like nothing, but to a uh, biologist brain is definitely not nothing. But uh, yeah, from an ordinary person, it looks yeah. like, and just life just, just explodes from it. So I guess uh, it's, it's in some ways kind of like a building in some ways. I mean, the building create this magnificent structure from nothing in a way. Yes, yeah. and if you're good at it, you can create habitat just like the desert does. You can deal with climates. And you can deal with uh, society, um, but you just have to make sure that your walls don't divide. They actually connect. Yeah, but it's <laughs> inclusive of, of, of the space that it's in. Yeah. That's great. Well, Craig, thanks so much for joining. Honored to call you a friend. I know you're super busy, so we really appreciate this. Um, this is gonna. This was recorded for anybody who missed it or missed the oh first boy. half. Well, I hope I didn't say anything that's gonna get me in trouble because I do no, that a lot. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much again, Craig, and I uh, hope to see you soon. All right. Cheers to everyone who joined. Thank you. Blessings and peace to everybody. Take Thanks, care, Craig. Take care. Mm -hmm.